Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 195 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days, just a buck, and if you have a staff of two or more, you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a few forum threads, one called Alternative to Bridging, another one called Help Understanding Huge Volume of Distance Laps Swimmers. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Rob Milani from Perform Better joins us to talk about the first one-day seminar in New Jersey, a new catalog, and a new power rack that Perform Better has developed. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about setting boundaries when it comes to cell phones. For our special segment with Alistair McCall, Alistair concludes his series on the seven keys to being a great coach. In part seven, he talks about investing in yourself. For the functional movement system segment, Eric Degatti is on to talk about what does your FMS score mean and how does it affect your programming. For the Hit the Gym with the Shred Coach, I have on Rhett Larson. Rhett is the Vice President of Just Play. He's a former Velocity and Exos Performance Coach. I spoke to Coach Larson about his experience the last five years working with the Chinese teams for the 2012 and 2016 Olympics. Really cool stories there. We went over coaching in a different culture, applauding spectacular failures, over coaching, mixing ages with training, and so much more. That coming up with Coach Larson in a little while. All right, lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I am doing outstanding, Anthony. How are you? Love it, love it. Happy birthday, by the way. Yesterday was your birthday on Halloween, so hope you had a good one. We did, but my birthday kind of is second fiddle to Halloween, unfortunately, these days. When you have kids, I think I probably got... Michaela did not trick or treat last night, March 11th, so I got about six more years of my birthday probably being... uh, the, uh, the second feature. <laughs> We're actually going to go out and have a little birthday dinner tonight. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's another, yeah, you don't want to go out on, a, like, restaurants. You can't go out on your birthday for, to, for you know, to a restaurant because it's... Well, then also you can't try to convince your kids to skip Halloween and yeah. go out on your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Coach, let's talk about a couple forum uh, topics. Ray, uh, no, no, uh, this was from... Um, John Mesner, and I, I thought it was interesting. Again, I know I do this a lot with forum threads, but did not think that this thing was going to get the traction that it got. And he was talking about bridging, and he was having some problems bridging some of his older clients. And I hadn't really experienced this. And I have, I have an 83 year old. I have several 70, you know, high 70s, low 70s, 60s. Um, he was talking about some different issues with. Uh, bridging, and I thought there were so many great responses. It, essentially, it came almost came down to trying like a four by four idea. Where okay, have you tried tall kneeling? Have you tried some standing, um, some standing mini band exercises? Have you tried doing this with the bridge on your back? So there was a lot of different advice. Uh, you know, Brett Jones uh, gave him a bunch of ideas, and then said, "Listen, if it still hurts." Just did just just ditch the bridge. So talk to us about this uh, this bridging idea and kind of where you go with it. Well, I I have sort of the same response that you did. Not as much. Oh, I didn't think it would get as much traction. But wow, how amazing a simple question becomes on the forum in terms of the, the kind of depth of answers that somebody gets. And I thought it. I think. Right away, I go to Brett's thing. Hey, if it hurts, it hurts. Don't do it. But I do also think that there was a bunch of stuff because right in, and Brett picked up on the same thing that I did, you know, talking about getting the shoulder blades off the ground. And I can always remember when I had yeah. people who didn't feel bridging in their glutes, 
the first thing, and I, it, it could have been Stuart McGill, I forget who it was, but somebody years ago at one of these seminars talking about core training just said, don't go up so high. Because sometimes the effort of trying to create hip extension creates a lot of lumbar extension, creates a lot of compensation. And it's sort of like, okay, just try to get your butt off the ground. Just like, so you can slide a piece of paper under there and thinking about just squeezing your glutes. And then I went sort of a different viewpoint in terms of, have you looked at, because I think I feel my lateral glutes most, more than anything, when I do mini bends. So it's like, okay, have you done mini band work? And I like mini bands. We bought, I got to get a picture. I actually meant, I posted that in another thread, but I got to take a picture of these new bands that perform better has made us, uh, they're, they're much more durable because I like them around your feet because when you get them around your feet, you get an internal rotation force by having the band on your actual foot that you don't get when it's at your ankles. And so now you've drawn your hip external rotators as well as your glutes into the movement. And so I get, you know, when we think about the fibers, of the glutes, and the way that they run, those lateral fibers are really important. So, and then Brett had suggested, hey, try the mini band at their knees with bridging. It's just, I just feel like, and with John, I know John is, if you look at his kind of literature, he's always like, have you done your core exercises today? And he's very adamant about the fact that doing good core stuff is going to be really life-changing and reduce back pain. And I'm 100% with him. But I think sometimes you've got to go macro versus micro. And that's why I suggested, have you tried just bodyweight squatting, you know, kind of chair squats, sitting good 24-inch box, whatever it is. Because, again, for someone who doesn't have any glute function, that'll get their glutes going. And so I think, as with everything, some people it's Olympic lifting, some people it's whatever. It's don't be tied to what you like. Just think about, okay, what am I, what am I trying to get accomplished? Is there another way? Is there something that's kind of completely, you know, the other side, maybe the guy will feel squatting more in his quads, but he's going to have a real hard time bending his knees and hips without using his glutes. And if you can get that without back pain, then in my mind, you're on your way to some successful programming, particularly for an elderly person. Or yeah. I've seen you cry. I have to figure out what the right name is. I need Patrick and Galen. She told me before, and I can't remember the word, but <laughs> it's like like uh, acceptable words now. You, you can't say old people. I think elder was the one that said elder isn't good. So, okay. Christ almighty. Hopefully she'll send me an email and remind me of what yeah. the right word is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember reading the article that actually predated the book Born to Run, but it was about the same idea. It was in, it was in I forget, some, uh, some like natural history, geographic book or something. It was an article basically saying why we're, we were made to run. And they were talking about even with walking, that heel strike activated the glutes. So that first heel strike. And so I think, like you said, you don't need to go up so high all the time just because they, quote unquote, don't feel it. They just might not be, uh, they might not have that really good body awareness. But I think there is certainly, you know, we talk about that dimmer switch with the glutes. There is certainly probably uh, some some glute activation there. So um, I agree 100%. Uh, certainly uh, many ways to skin that cat. Uh, Coach, there was a good thread um, that Ray McCarthy started. <laughs> he wrote, you know, just getting frustrated, I guess, working with swimmers. I don't get it. We've stopped running football players around and around the football field. For short-distance runners, we don't run them around. and we, You know, we don't run them around the field. What makes swimming so different? It seems like swimmers swim every day year round and lots of laps and I, and I have to agree I'm, I'm actually I'll throw this out to the world I'm going to go to the crash bees it'll be the first time on the BU ice at, uh, at the Aganis but the crash bees are the indoor rowing championships in February and anybody can enter and I'm going to do it I'm going to start it next week my, my training is February 12th but I just pulled up I did a I did a three month rowing program right for a 2k race it came up with rowing for six days in a row okay different types of rowing and it does seem to be cultural can you just talk to us about this thread and this idea uh, about usually about the endurance athletes well yeah I think particularly rowing well I mean really rowing running swimming 
are still dominated by the, this is the way I used to train people. And rowing the same way. I've had this argument with the running people, with the rowing people, with the swimming people over now a 30-year period where it's always been, shouldn't we do less and more quality? And everybody loves to default back. And we, you know, we've gone through it in the same way. I just saw a thread on that rugby talking about how the aerobic system is, you know, the, the underappreciated redheaded stepchild of, um, of rugby training. And it's, you know, it's that pendulum thing that Alan Cosgrove likes to talk about in the sense that the pendulum swings one way, but it always swings back. You know, it just is the way that it is. And, Swimming, I can remember now. I'm going to go way back for you because he was a commentator. So I can remember at Auburn in the 80s and praising the strength training that he was doing at Auburn with the world records that he was setting and his great performance at the Olympics. And they were talking about under distance and how they've done so much less. And that pendulum has swung probably three times. You look at Derek Torres, if you saw, if you read Age is Not a Number. Uh, Derek Torres' book, which I really like, she talked about the same thing in terms of as she got older and continued to train at the Olympics, how she increased her strength training and drastically re- reduced the amount of distance she was doing. But it just keeps going back the other way because there's always some coach. And maybe I, I'm going to get a little psychological on you here. I think that coaches by nature tend to not be gifted performers but overachievers. And they've always benefited by doing more. It's always been what helped them to excel. And so they don't end up being scientists as much as they just end up being people who prescribe their same kind of overachiever, overwork mentality to everybody that they coach. And that's why, so I, and then I can flip back. I'm reading, uh, I think Krajenhoff is the way that you pronounce the guy's name, but it's called Need for Speed, which is sort of, in my mind, it's the, it's the Charlie Francis training system rewritten for the 2000s, but it's he's a Dutch sprint coach. And basically saying the same thing that we've been saying, that Charlie Francis is saying this whole idea of that you should go short to long and not long to short, that less is more, blah, blah, blah. But it's just one of those things where if you leave a bunch of these people around, eventually somehow the endurance guy takes charge and next thing you know, everybody's volume goes up and a certain amount of people get hurt and a certain amount of people have tendonitis and, but somebody sets a record. And then everybody, instead of looking at the 10 things that went wrong, they look at the 10 things that went right. And, and they point at that and say, see, this is why, as opposed to looking at it and saying that the reality is maybe that person would have set a world record no matter what they did, but nobody wants to think about it that way or listen to it. Yeah. Also, I think there's an outlier uh, quotient there too, right? I mean, there's, there's, we always, we, we seem to always want to look at these outliers and we also want to use them as excuses. Like I used to always say like with John Daly in my, in my world, uh, well, John Daly didn't need to work out, you know, we'll look where, look how long he lasted and look how good he was doing. Uh, was he at his best? So, you know, I think we always look at these people that are outliers and, you know, we don't know physiologically how physiologically gifted they are, genetically gifted they are as well. Um, so it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting point that I think, you know, Ray expressed his frustration there and I, I get it. Like I said, with this idea about the rowing uh, that I'm, I'm looking at, I'm like, this is crazy to, to be thinking you're going to be rowing every single day. It's not going to happen anyway, but... Um, well, but also, I think, I think we also tend to look only at the outliers that we want to see. Because I would look at that and I think, why didn't everybody say, I want my tennis players to be freaking jacked like Venus? Or like Serena, rather. You know what I mean? Like Serena Williams has been the best player in tennis for a really long time. But you still don't see people dying and saying, you know, I got to get my daughter in the weight room and get her freaking like yeah. just big and strong. Because the best player in the world yeah. is an absolute freaking monster. That's a good point. But, but it's because that's not what they want to see. You know, she's the outlier. No, oh, no, I don't like that outlier idea. I like the outlier that reinforces the things that I want to have happen as yeah. opposed to the outlier that doesn't. And I think that's why I said when you've got so many of these kind of 
overachiever coaches because I've watched it myself. I watched it in hockey and with one of my um, friends and former coworkers who I will not mention because it's not necessarily complimentary, but one of the big things I did with our BU hockey guys was I was like, the emphasis is on big and strong and the emphasis is not on the aerobic system. And, you know, we're going to, we really like, we got down to where we, even at that stage, in the nineties, we were doing one aerobic workout, like one steady state workout a week. And that was it. But this guy, when he got his first head coaching job was a distance runner. And next thing you knew, you know, his guys were doing three distance runs a week because that was what he liked to do. Instead of looking at it and saying like, one of the things I, and I say this all the time, you've been in enough seminars with me where I am always saying the, the smartest thing you can do is to copy. And it's amazing how many people just can't be content to copy, can't be content to look and think, hey, you know, the smart guy sitting next to me in class, I'm just going to look at his paper. <laughs> He's letting me look. I'm just going to glance over there, write down all his answers. Instead of sitting there and thinking, I don't know, you know, so I, it, I go back to the idea of, uh, you know, when my kids were little, they wanted to tie their own shoes, even if it took a week. You know, they're like, I can do it myself. Yeah. I can tie them. It's like, okay, you know, and eventually if you had to go somewhere, you had to tie them for them. But otherwise, you just leave them there and let them, let them make mistake after mistake after mistake and keep trying. And sometimes I feel like there's a lot of people that are that way in coaching in terms of, you know, I love there's a, it's actually, it's on the site. And it's, I told you I'd ramble because I'm, I'm way over. But um, there's a great Dan Path audio on uh, Strength Coach site where it, on it, and you've probably listened to it, Dan talks about how, his, uh, he used to recruit basketball players to be his middle distance guys when he was first coaching track. And, you know, he'd get them from basketball and they'd get him out to a track. And he's like, yeah, you know, they'd run low fifties in the quarter. Um, you know, and he said, and I'd coach them all the way down to 53. <laughs> you know, he said, every guy got worse with me coaching him. He said they were doing better for playing basketball. He said, so after a while, I just let him go to basketball practice and stop trying to coach him in track. He said, but then that started to make me realize that I was obviously doing something, even though I thought I was doing everything right. These basketball kids would show up and beat my guys that I was training for the quarter mile, who I was training, quote unquote, right. And they were doing their distance work and they were doing all the stuff they were supposed to do. And that's the stuff that I get frustrated with, with people because they're not, even if you, if you're not sure, do the experiment. Look, what do you got to lose by saying, Hey, you know, this year I'm going to, I'm going to have some people do a little bit more under distance work and some people do a little bit more over distance work and compare, but people are unwilling. And so they end up, they just keep kind of falling in the same pit over and over and over again. Absolutely. For rambling? There you go. Well, I'm glad I only had, uh, I didn't do enough research and I only got uh, two questions. So, uh, coach, That's right. we're going uh, to, my, my average is 47 and a half. There you go. So. Yeah. I think, yeah, definitely seven and a half. All right, coach, we'll let All you right, go. Well, I'm a minute late for my one o'clock appointment. All right. We'll talk I to you next time. I will see you soon, and Thank All you. Right. All right. Now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better. And today I got on Rob Milani. Rob, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Anthony. All right, bud. Uh, let's. You know what? Jersey's coming. It's November second, so we got like a month away. Wow, the one days are here. Talk to me about uh, the one day. Yeah, it's that time of year, Anthony. We're about to start up here December third down at uh, Precy Speed School in Fairlawn. One of our uh, original one days lineups all set. We got a uh, Bush next nighter, the most winning track and field coach in uh, U.S. history. Former LSU guy, great speed guy. Lee Burton, uh, FMS, Charlie Weingroff, and Martin Rooney down there. So great lineup, December 3rd, uh, all available online right now, too. So definitely check that out, and then we'll be following that up out in San Fran, January 21st. Nice. you got the two Jersey boys with the two Southern boys. It's going to be a nice contrast. All right. <laughs> North meets South down there, for sure. There you go. Well, I know you guys are working on the new catalog. What's the status of that? You know, they're actually doing our final proofs on it today, so uh, we're going to go to print next week, and... All those guys out there will start seeing it in about three to four weeks dropping home. So we're excited about it. A lot of work went into it this year and a ton of new products in there. So we're definitely excited about uh, next year's catalog. Very cool. Now, you want to talk about a new rack. Is that that's a, this is a new one that's in the, in the catalog? Yeah, it's a variation of our half rack, which has been you know very successful for us. Um, we try and put a, definitely a good quality to it, but a good price quality on there, too. So we went and just built out a full power rack this year. It was 
probably our most asked for piece throughout the year was something that people could get fully inside, feel a little bit more safe, be uh, completely enclosed around the rack. So we took our, our great half rack, which is uh, you know, a lot of unique features on there with the pistol grips, the locking mechanisms, full hard chromey on there, and we converted it into a, a nice power rack. Put upper band peg attachments, with, which we've been training with uh, quite a bit lately. A little bit different style of training, but uh, pretty unique and a, definitely a nice change-up night. And then still the ability to do all of our connectors, too. So we'll start seeing those in all of our facility design stuff. So if anyone is uh, doing a new facility, certainly definitely ask for it. We can drop it right into your, uh, your layouts for it. But those are available right now. And then we continue to build upon that PB Extreme line. So you'll see about five to eight new products coming out there in the catalog. Oh, very cool. Um, now, what about um, with that rack? I know you guys have had, like you just said, you have like some of the, the bells and whistles on it. Is there a pull-up bar attachment on that? or? Yeah, what, what's kind of cool about ours is we do that P-grip. So we do a 12, 18, and 24-inch P-grip on our pull-up. It's all fully knurled. They sit right off the front, um, which is a little bit unique to what we do. We throw the upper and lower band peg attachments on there. We have all the weak storage to it, too, so you can put your bumpers or traditional steel plates on there. And all of our J-cups are completely locked in, too, so... You don't have the uh, ability for someone to come up under the J-cup, have it pop off. They do have a pistol grip lock on there. And we Lexan code everything, too. So the day that rack gets installed, it should look the same way in about 10 years, which is uh, definitely a little bit more uh, on the working front end of it, but something that's going to last you know, a long time and still show really well 10 years down the road. All uh, right. Very cool. Rob, thanks for coming on today, talking about the new rack and uh, and and New Jersey, which is only a month away, so uh, looking forward to that. Hopefully, I will be at New Jersey this year. I missed last year, so uh, uh, thanks for coming on. Sounds good, dude. Hope to see you in New Jersey. Hi, welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Eric Gagatti, and today I'm going to be talking about what does your FMS score mean, and more in particular, what does it mean for my training program? And this is a, a topic that comes up quite a bit over the years of, of teaching the course in that we focus quite a bit on learning how to do the screening. We, we then learn how to interpret those results and find out what is your key focus pattern that we need to address and what are the things that we need to be uh, most concerned with. And then if you've ever been to a level two course, you see that we dive in head first and spend sometimes hours just breaking down one pattern in particular. And it, it, it's awesome stuff. And, and what ends up sometimes getting lost in it, though, is what did that client come in for in the first place? And so when, when uh, I teach, I always say, well, we have to remember is that in all my years of doing this in, in you know, probably over 15 years of, of using the, you know, the FMS is that not once of all the hundreds of clients that I ever worked with have has anybody ever come in and say i want to set, sign up for a bunch of sessions because i want to improve my active straight leg race and uh what normally people come in and it used to be the um banner line for my facility was people come in for one of three reasons they want to look better they want to feel better or they want to perform better and we always have to keep that in our mind and understand that the FMS is a means to an end and is not the end all be all. And it's not also not a standalone thing. So person comes in and regardless of their goal, one of the first things we'll, we're going to do is put you through a movement screen to see uh, what you're capable of. And are there any red flags that are going to come up that I need to know about that could end up becoming a problem down the road if we add additional stress of an exercise program to you. Now, what comes out of that is we're going to have a, a, a set of scores and we're going to have ones and twos and threes and zeros and pluses and minuses. And now when I look at that, how does that then translate into a training program? Well, the first thing I need to, to understand is that those scores don't just tell me what I should do. They also more importantly tell me what I should not do. And the first thing I'm going to look for, is there any zeros or ones? And if there's a zero there, well, there's pain. And that's, that's their, their body's way of telling you that something is wrong here and that this needs to get addressed. And I certainly don't want to add any more load into that or any more stress into that. And that needs to get figured out by a qualified uh, clinician that can figure out what is the source of that pain before I even think about introducing exercise into that. Because it, at the very least, it'll be fruitless. And at the very worst, it'll, make it, it'll uh, exacerbate the problem. Secondly, now I'm going to look and see, is there any ones? And ones, remember, are on the far 
left side of the scale is that there's a big bell curve on that one, two, and three scoring, and that most of the people are going to fall in that, in that big bell of, of a score of a two, and that is your average. The outliers are the threes and the ones. Threes I don't get all wrapped up in because three is, is perfect, and we don't need, want to get, have uh, perfection get in the way of good enough when it comes down to getting started with the training program uh, for what their goal is that they actually came in for. The one is the outlier on the other side, and that's telling me that they are uh, so low in their, their capacity and, and capability of, of doing this, executing this most fundamental movement pattern that, uh, that they have scored only the score of a one. Now, those are the ones that I'm most concerned with. Now, with that, there's a great system that, that Brett Jones came up with called the red light, green light, uh, yellow light system. And that kind of helps guide you to say that if someone has a one here, that the, there's a series of exercises that correlate with that specific pattern. And if we take the active straight leg raise, which is one of the most common flaws that you'll see, is that correlates a lot with hip hinging. And so anything hip hinging related, we're going to want to take out of that program. So that's your kettlebell swings, your deadlift, uh, anything that I'm going to be hinging at the hips, especially bilaterally, if there's an asymmetrical score, I want to make sure I take that out of the program for now. Now, the challenge that's going to bring about is it's going to bring about a few things. On the side of the trainer, it's going to bring about the challenge now that if you are um, someone that is very – uh, dogmatic in their ways, and they are very set that all my clients do kettlebell swings. And I tell you that this client is probably not best suited for kettlebell swings. Now we have a, a dilemma and a issue of, well, what do I do instead? And it's going to challenge the trainer to think outside of the box and say, how do I now accomplish what we're looking to achieve here without exacerbating a pre-existing issue? The, the other thing is, is to say there is attachments by on the client side, on the, on the uh, person doing the program side, that there may be their personal attachments to certain exercises, and they love the bench press, and they come in with a one-two shoulder mobility, and we, we know that that's probably not going to be the best thing for them right now. It doesn't mean bench press is bad, is that they are not uh, best suited to do that right now. So how do I sell them? on the fact that not only am I taking away something you have a strong personal attachment to in the bench, but how do I sell them on the fact that I need to give them something alternative? Well, there's a few key talking points to that. Um, number one is that we have to always understand that there's a uh, premise of that this is modification, not shutdown. That this is a minor and temporary modification until we can get this cleared. So we're going to do two things. We're going to take out the... Uh, things that could be aggravating stressors, and that may be the bench press at the moment. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add in some things that can help alleviate this issue. And so if it's a shoulder mobility problem, maybe it's a lack of thoracic rotation to one side. Um, and so we start adding in some rib pulls, and we start adding in some things that start to restore that thoracic mobility. And the next thing you know, this person now starts – to, to even out and becomes a 2-2. Two, two. Well, that's now where we can start to say that's where we're looking to be. And once you can own that score, well, we can start reintroducing a bench press. So the same could be said for an active straight leg raise and someone who's a runner and trying to get them to, to back off of running is not the easiest thing to do. So if we could say, listen, temporarily, we're going to give you something else that's going to get your heart rate up, that's going to keep you in condition physiologically, but from a movement standpoint, what we want to do is we want to give you some corrections that are going to address this issue. And as soon as we can get to where you're owning two twos on each side, well, then we can start to reintroduce running again, or we can start to reintroduce the bench press again. And so the, the key with that is they can see there's a carrot there and that there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's going to be more motivating for the uh, client to, to be diligent with their program and, and be on top of getting themselves to that double two. And the other key with this is that we have to understand psychologically what, what people are expecting out of their exercise program. And what I mean by that is there's, there's some key questions I've asked every client I've ever worked with in all my years. And the first thing is, is why are you here? Uh, what is it that you're looking to achieve? And then not long after that, I always ask the question, how do you know if I did my job? How do you know if we had a good workout or a good session? 
And 99% of the time, I got the same two answers. The answers were this. It was, A, it was hard. I sweat a lot. It was really difficult. And B, I was really sore afterwards. And I say, if that's your only criteria, well, then, hey, you can come and, you know, do yard work for me and you'll sweat a lot and be sore, but it won't necessarily get you to your goal. And what I, and, but understanding that mentality is that if you can replace something that they were, uh, that they were attached to with something that's just as challenging, it's going to give them the same psychological feedback of, oh, this is hard. This is, I'm sweating a lot. This is difficult. This is tough. That, and I can do that. Um, if you know how to work your modifications, you know how to work your, your, your progressions and your regressions well. And so you take that person who's a, a gung-ho uh, type A person that wants to grind and wants to sweat, and, they, and you tell them, well, you know, you can't do kettlebell swings or deadlifts right now. I still have a huge library of things that I can give them that are going to still kick their butt. And they're going to get what their desired effect in, in, in response was. And I will know in my mind that I'm not setting them backwards. Simultaneously, I can give those corrections to them that will keep them moving forward so they no longer have any limitations. And the FMS kind of phases itself out as a standalone because once you get to all twos equally, I'm not really concerned with, with uh, having so many uh, red light or yellow light exercises to give to you. So the key in that is really selling it and to have them understand that this is not about a, a long-term thing. And I'm also not going to set aside the first 20 minutes or half hour of your session just doing rib pulls and, and, or, or, or band exercises that may, uh, you may perceive as not what you want to get you to your goal. So I could take those things in between and make them an active rest period. So instead of standing around and, and BSing about what we did this weekend, I could have you, as soon as you're done with your goblet squats and in between, I can have you drop down to a, a half kneeling position and have you do some, some chops or some lifts, or I can have you do some, some half get ups and you're going to, you're going to have a, uh, a, a, a metabolic effect from that. You're also going to feel the, 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 the burn and the challenge that you're looking for. And I can get in some of those key correctives that I'm looking to, to put in. So everybody's satisfied by it. The last piece that I would that I would put to this is that when we're looking at how does my score affect my exercise program, let's look beyond the total score. The total score is nice for research and it's nice for large groups, but it really doesn't apply to individuals. So if we take that that key cutoff point that we've seen in a lot of research of the 14, the 14 can become about a lot of different ways. If you're a 14, that's seven symmetrical twos. I don't have nearly the concerns I have that if I have someone who has some threes, some ones, a one, two, a one, three here, and they still add up to the same 14 total. They're, they're completely different profiles. Again, our biggest concerns are zeros and ones and, and asymmetries. And, and even in, 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 for the most part, just those zeros and ones. And so once I can get you to where you're at two, at the level of two, I'm not going to keep chasing after a three because there's nothing that really shows or anything that I can tell you that I've seen personally in all the hundreds of clients I've done it with, that there's a, going to be a substantial difference in performance in terms of how they feel or in terms of what you're going to get out of your exercise program if you're a three versus a two. So again, don't focus on total scores. Don't look at this as a standalone thing. Look at this through the eyes of this client came in for a specific goal. What do I need to do to modify their program temporarily if I do find any restrictions to make sure that I'm not making the program worse because trainers and gyms that, that hurt people don't have a real good reputation and they're real tough to keep a business going that way. Um, as well as how can I make this as efficient as possible, give them what they want both physiologically and psychologically. And then, you know, last but not least, make sure this person is moving forward. And now I have a, a tangible way to go back and check on the front of their body composition or their performance, but I can go back and make sure all the while, not only have I not made their movement worse, but I've actually improved that as well as an added bonus. That will do it for today. For more information, check out functionalmovement.com. Hi everybody, it's Rachel Cosgrove with the Business of Fitness segment with Results Fitness University. Today I want to talk about setting boundaries when it comes to our cell phones. I know this world has changed quite a bit in the last 17 years since we first opened our gym. Cell phones weren't such a 
nor, you know, not everybody had a cell phone when we opened our gym. Yes, we're old and it's been a, it's been a long time. Um, but there was no Facebook and there, you know, things have changed a lot. And so, you know, when we first opened, you know, we were very clear about setting boundaries. And so, you know, having our business phone line separate from our home phone line, and that was a very simple thing to do. I know this has gotten a lot more complicated with the way things are now because everybody has a cell phone, everybody texts everybody, everybody, you know, it's, it's very hard to set those boundaries. I mean, Facebook, I mean, there's just, you know, it, you, everybody ends up being, you know, available at all times. And so as a fitness professional, you know, really thinking about how can I set these boundaries? Because I think having boundaries is so important to you as you are building your business, because you need to have that time away from your business. And so just something I wanted to quickly go over today on this segment of the podcast is uh, really, you know, starting to make you think about whether you should be giving your cell phone out to your clients, whether they should have access to you 24 seven, you know, if they have a thought, they can text you. And basically, you know, they have that, that's, that's pretty valuable, uh, you know, mind space that they are, they're able to connect to, um, at any time, any, any day, whenever they want. And so starting to really guard your time, guard your mind, um, and, and really, you know, guard your space. And so I would suggest not giving out your cell phone to your clients. This also works as you do build your business. Um, and so if you do feel like you do want to give them access to you, or maybe your cell phone is your business phone. I know for a lot of clients that are a lot of trainers, that's the thing is the cell phone is, that is their business line because most people don't even have a landline anymore. Um, so maybe have either a separate cell phone or you can always use something like a Google voice number, which that way you can, you can turn it off and you can turn it on. So a Google voice number, then they don't have your actual cell phone number. They have a cell phone number that is your business number that um, they can call during business hours and you can turn it back off, you know, when you're off and you're no longer available to them. Um, you know, and just set those boundaries for your clients. Let them know, listen, you know, you can reach me on this line from during these hours, you know, after this time, I don't answer this, this line or you cannot text me. Um, because I think that that is just going, you know, that's just going beyond the boundaries of our, our, you know, us as a professional. Um, I think, you know, people will start to take advantage of it. And I think just as, you know, fitness professionals in our industry, we just, we need to start to think about how do we set those boundaries? How do we, you know, really make sure that, um, you know, we long-term can sustain this? Cause I think burnout is such a real thing for our industry. And one of the pro one of the reasons we burn out is because we're on 24 seven and we're available 24 seven. And so, uh, starts to, you know, it's okay to say no and it's okay to set those boundaries. It's okay to set those, that schedule and say, listen, this is my business hours. This is when I'm available for you. And, uh, and, you know, really start to, to be the professional that you are. And, uh, you know, you can demand those professional fees and not be available 24 seven and still help your clients. Nothing that our clients are dealing with, um, is a nine one one. We're not, you know, we're not emergency doctors. We're not surgeons. We're not, you know, people who are, um, you know, are going to get the call in the middle of the night that we're going to save someone's life. Um, you know, for most of our clients, the question can wait until the next morning or it can wait till the next day. And so that's something that, um, you know, you just want to start to think about as you are, you know, setting up your business and as you're building your clientele in the beginning, this may not seem like a big idea, but as you get more and more clients, it's going to be a huge, huge deal. So, um, just start to think about putting those boundaries in place. So thanks everyone for tuning in again. This is Rachel Cosgrove and the business of fitness segment with results fitness university. Check out resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Sign up on our email list to get weekly updates. Thanks so much. Talk to you guys soon. Hi everyone. Alistair McCaw here and awesome to be back with you on the strength coach podcast. Today we're on to the final chapter in this segment of the seven keys to being a great coach. And already over the last six episodes, we've been able to cover chapters one to six. So before we get into today's chapter, investing in yourself as a coach, let's shoot through a quick summary of those six chapters. In chapter one, we spoke about the importance of setting your standards, because as I, as I always love to say, it all starts with your standards. In chapter two, we looked at building your method or philosophy. Chapter three, we spoke about your ability to adapt as a coach. In chapter four, we covered the importance of having a great energy. In chapter five, we looked at your interpersonal skills. And in the last episode, chapter six, we covered the importance of mastering the fundamentals and applying the fundamentals. Today, I'm super excited to bring you probably my favorite chapter of the book, and that is about investing in yourself. Let me start with this. I've not come across a single great coach or successful person who hasn't or doesn't consistently keep investing in themselves. 
In my eyes, investing in yourself is probably one of the best things you can do. Why? Because you benefit and so does everyone else around you. Like Warren Buffett says, there's no better investment you can make than in yourself. As I've already stated in previous chapters, there are many commonalities between the most successful coaches in the world, but probably the greatest and most impactful one is how much time they invest in themselves and their careers. You, yes you, are your biggest investment. You are the most important place you can put your time, energy, effort, and money. Investing in yourself is not a selfish act. In fact, by helping make your life better, you will by default make the lives and performances of everyone else around you better. And isn't that ultimately what our goal is as coaches? Great coaches invest in themselves, not just sometimes, but every day. They have built great habits and routines into their daily lifestyle, and that includes time for reading and researching. They also love to interact with fellow coaches and people outside of the industry. In fact, anywhere where they can learn something new. These coaches are curious and are lifelong learners, people that are interested in learning and understanding more every day. In fact, before I go any further, let me remind you that you're actually investing in yourself right now by listening to this podcast, so great job. Unlike some other investments out there, investing in yourself is never a risk because it always pays off. Personally, I have never regretted a day of self-investment. Being a lifelong learner has helped me embrace and discover so much more. Great coaches understand the importance of investing in themselves and their careers. They understand that the payback isn't always immediate, but it always pays off sooner than later. As we know, coaching is about serving others. It's about putting others' needs before our own. In a way, it also sends out a powerful message to the world. It's important that you structure your day and set time aside for areas you want to invest in. For example, I make sure that I get 20 minutes of reading done at first thing in the morning and then again before bed. I also make a point to listen to a podcast when I go out to run. I call this learn, learning while I run, multitasking if you like. I also aim to attend two workshops or conferences a year related into my industry and two that aren't. For example, working on my interpersonal skills or even marketing skills, which I might add Rachel and Alan Cosgrove do a great job with, with that on the Strength Coach podcast. And if you get a chance, get out to their facility and see them. Lastly, something I strongly believe in and that the most important appoint, appointment of the day is with yourself. That means putting yourself first, doing the things you feel will make you better in all your areas, be it as a coach, partner, parent, coworker, whatever. When you invest in yourself, a world of opportunities open up for you and where you are the best version of yourself you will be an attraction magnet to others. Just like the subtitle of my book states, become your best and they will too. So finally, a quick summary of all seven chapters. Set your standards, build your method, adapt to those in front of you, bring a great energy, improve your interpersonal skills, learn and apply the fundamentals, and invest in yourself every day. Well, coaches, we've come to the end of our seven-part series on the seven keys to being a great coach. I want to not only thank you for your valuable time, but also Anthony Arena here on the Strength Coach Podcast. To connect, you can reach reach me on Twitter at Alistair McCaw. And remember, my book, The Seven Keys to to Being a Great Coach, can be found on Amazon.com. Until we speak again, I'm Alistair McCaw wishing you greatness today. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have on Rhett Larson. And Rhett is a former Exos performance manager who was working at Exos uh, back uh, five years ago and was asked to go to China to work with uh, a bunch of the different teams there for the 2012 Olympics. And uh, he did so well, they asked him to come back. And he ended up working with the uh, China's golden team, as he calls it, uh, they, uh, where he just worked with the, the women's volleyball team and they ended up winning a gold in Brazil uh, this past uh, summer. So uh, wanted to get him on to talk about he wrote a great article as well for uh, for Daniel Coyle on the Talent Code uh, blog. So I wanted to get him on to talk about uh, some of his experiences in China and uh, and working with kids and working in a different culture. So uh, Rhett, thanks for, so much for coming on. Hey, my pleasure. Ni hao. <laughs> All right. Um, I was wondering how you said that. You said that in the email. I'm like, oh, how do you pronounce that? I'm not even going to attempt it. On Man, on- it's tricky. As anyone that's been in China knows, the, the hardest part to say ni hao is, you know, that's spelled N-I and then H-A-O. But you have to say the hao 
like you're kind of going down a mountain and then back up it. If you were to just say ni hao, it's a totally different word. So every every word has like four pronunciations. That's what makes it impossible. In fact, the Chinese name that I was given by the judo team, I have zero ability to pronounce it. So I've had to abandon it for my inability to even say my own name. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So let's talk about your experience in China. You've been there for five years now, and uh, you were asked to go down there for the 2012 Olympics. Probably thought, you know, you're going to go do some training and come right back after the Olympics. But uh, they asked you to stay. Take us, uh, let's go back to 2011, I guess, and uh, tell us this story from working in the 2012 Olympics all the way up to the Brazil Olympics. Yeah, it's the origin story starts actually at Velocity Sports Performance. I was at VSP for 11 years and I had kind of reached a nice, uh, a really great job there. And I was the director of coaching for the network, which didn't actually involve me doing a ton of coaching. And, you know, we spend so much time preaching about the benefits of, of being uncomfortable and um, grit and struggle. And I wasn't doing a lot of that in the job there. So when Mark and uh, Brent Calloway approached me to possibly lead a team that went over to China to train a bunch of China's top teams for the London Olympics. It was exactly the kind of thing that I'd been advising athletes and other people to do for a long time. And it was just one of those little golden opportunities. I was single at the time. Um, it was only going to be for 11 months. And so I decided to go over there. And you know, it turns out to be one of the most impactful decisions that I ever made. And, and not only for the work that we got to do, because, you know, immediately we get to start working um, with the, the elite Chinese divers, the gymnasts, the, the judo athletes, um, the table tennis, all of these gold medal factories in China, um, which is an incredible experience. You know, you, you get to use you get to flex your coaching muscles, analyzing um, how you can make the agility of a table tennis player better or how in the world I can create better core strength in a, in a judo athlete that already won a gold medal. Um, these are like these amazing challenges. And, you know, from an impact standpoint, it's not just the work, but, uh, you know, I get to go over there and be with this team of incredible coaches. And one of the things I've learned coaching overseas is how much, maybe even as an American coach, we don't know about the way other coaches are doing things. I have yeah, for instance, David Joyce, he's been on your podcast. It's, it's like I show up freshman year of college and all of a sudden I got Tom Hanks as a roommate. Like I just have this really engaging, smart person. And, and that's one of you know, eight guys over there that I start learning from, the Australians, the Brits, the Argentinians. Um, <clears throat> and so working with these teams and in that fully integrated system, and this is um, joining Exos for the first time, um, was – you know, it, in the way that you hear on the, you know, the art of coaching with Exos, like they have a comprehensive and um, fully vetted system that works when you put the right people in place. And so we use that system and uh, and and put that into the Chinese uh, into some of these Chinese teams. But of course, being in China, nothing goes as planned and they don't want to do any nutrition. And they think the mental training is ridiculous. So we have to be incredibly flexible, which turns out to be one of the things that <clears throat> that um, was a skill set that I have definitely had to learn over the last couple of years. When you will get – you'll go in and give a presentation to the, the badminton team and they will just flatly reject 60 <laughs> percent of the premise of, of the way you – of your methodology. Huh. <clears throat> and, and so um, all of these things, uh, it, it started steamrolling into um, a lot of big wins with a lot of their, their key sports. It resulted in 20-some gold medals throughout – and by the way, this is me and a team of eight. And 20-some uh, and, and gold medals, uh, multiple, multiple medals. Um, and that, of course, raised a lot of eyebrows in, in China and, and – you know, and as a result, a team of us got uh, got invited to go to Shanghai and work with those teams in Shanghai, all their elite athletes for the three years after that. And then I just got this wonderful opportunity. Um, I still have in me um, 
this really big drive to work with younger athletes. The, the work that we did at Velocity is some of the most impactful I've ever had. And and when a company called Just Play, a Chinese company, um, approached me about trying to develop a program that could be used with younger athletes in sports schools across China, in high schools and middle schools across China, that that hit a part of my heart that I hadn't really gotten to work too much with. Now, in China, even the elite athletes are, you know, you get Chinese divers that are 11 and 12. So I'm still flexing my child or my uh, youth long-term athlete development muscles a lot, but not in a way that could potentially be that impactful and leave that much of a legacy. So I I jumped over to Just Play. Um, it was a super tough decision to leave Exos because you know, so many good friends there and, and Mark is a fantastic leader. But um, as soon as I started kind of laying a foundation for how I was going to train a bunch of coaches in working with youth athletes in China, um, I got a call from the from the Chinese women's volleyball team, who is, as you mentioned, China's golden team. They are as <clears throat> whereas China excels in all these individual sports like shooting and archery and gymnastics and weightlifting. Um, they don't traditionally do very well in team sports. I mean, you can blame the one child policy. You can. Um, blame the school system for not letting kids probably uh, free think very much, but they don't have those teams dialed in yet. China volleyball, women's volleyball is an exception. They they got a gold medal in the late 80s, um, and that's the only one they've ever gotten. So, and there's been a drought ever since then, but they just got back their super VIP uh, head coach who had coached in America for in London. She coached the women's team in London to a silver medal in the USA team. Um, so she just was back from the USA to China and there was all these expectations and she brought, she, you know, got a really young group of girls around her, but she had seen in the United States, the impact of, of Western styles of strength training. So she wanted to hire me to come in and just take over that strength. And, you know, long story short, um, you know, we, surprised a lot of people and won the world cup. And then she strategically overhauled that world cup winning team to bring on a lot of younger athletes that maybe the other teams hadn't seen before that you know, they hadn't been able to strategize against before. And we went to London with a team that was really, I mean, the youngest team in London, um, really inexperienced, but she's one of the most incredible tacticians I've ever seen. And without getting into the volleyball part of it, you know, what is said on the commentary is that her name is Long Ping and, and uh, Long Ping plays chess while other people play checkers. And she is uh, just made adjustments that resulted in one of the most Disney moment, like runs through the Olympics as possible. We came out of pool play in eighth place, last place after having lost to two teams that we never lose to. We got crushed by team USA in pool play. And then as a result of coming out eighth, we have to play in number one Brazil in the first round of the playoffs in, in Rio. And Brazil hadn't lost one game in pool play. And we stun everybody and, and, and beat them. And through her playing a bunch of rookies that no one had really even seen before. And then we go on to beat um, we go on to beat the Netherlands who had beaten us in pool play. And then we go on to beat Serbia who had beaten USA and, and we won it. And, you know, it, it was just really, you know, I get made fun of a lot because Chinese t TV caught me bawling like a baby uh, as, you know, running around hugging these girls. But uh, but I uh, don't regret a single minute of it. That's so cool. I remember uh, your face on Facebook. You had you were in I forget what at the closing ceremonies. I think it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, watching your video is very cool. Um, you know, yeah, just to give people an idea how big it is there, you were telling me 72% of all televisions in China watch the finals. And that's like, that <laughs> just makes the Super Bowl look like yeah. a joke. You said a million dollars bonus to each no. girl, right? It's actually, it was $2.8 million approximately. Wow. I don't know that. For sure, but I have it on good authority through wow. good sources. That and that's not atypical. Like it, when I run that number by Chinese people that are in the know, that's that's to think 
and not only that, these girls are celebrities now. I mean, every billboard, <laughs> these girls are, they renamed universities after our head coach it's after crazy. this. There's statues being erected. It's, it's, it is so important every, it, cause it spans generations. The head coach is this, was a player back when everybody's mom and grandma watched her win the Olympic gold. And then she comes back as a, as a coach and takes this team of little upstarts bad news bears into it and uh and wins it it's one of those great stories that unfortunately disney will ever never make a movie out of but if they, if they do i want ryan gosling playing me there you go it's already done deal um right. so let me ask you though because i mean i look i'm gonna admit it i have some stereotypes and i i know nothing about china i really don't I've never right. been there, but I have these, this, this idea, this scary idea in communist China and that, you know, if you make a wrong move, you're going to go to jail. And if you don't win, something bad's going to happen to you. But, um, talk to me about like just going over there. It's a totally different culture. Talk to us about the culture that's so different from, from an, you know, the, the American culture and, and, and what were some of the adjustments that you kind of had to make or deal with? All right. First of all, from a thrown in jail standpoint, this is my mom's biggest fear every <laughs> single time I go to the airport. It, At least I'm not is, alone. Yeah, it is actually really difficult to get thrown in jail in China. You have to do horrible things. You can really make an idiot of yourself in front of a police officer and he'll get you home. OK, that's the nice thing. Um, but the parts that you're thinking about, probably with the way that young athletes are trained, are completely true. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to say it's not as bad as you think, and parts of it aren't. But this is a mind. Sh this is a mindset shift, and it's. I, I'll tell you a story. I was when I was working with the team, and I won't even tell you where or when. But it wasn't. It wasn't a national team. I, it was one of my favorite team of female athletes down in Shanghai, and they were coached by a massive man. And after one of our one of my ESD sessions with the team that I thought went really well. Like this team worked so hard. The girls would, if they started feeling sick and they knew they were going to puke, would hide behind trees to puke so that I wouldn't see them and think that they were weak. You know, and these girls so just came out after a great ESD session and he just starts lining them up. And this is before I could speak Mandarin very well. And he's just laying into this, these teams of this girl, these girls for some reason. And then he pulls up one of the 17 year old junior girls and he's towering over her as he's shouting and she's just sitting there at attention with her hands behind her back. And then he lays her out, just backhands her to the ground. And you know, my voice cracks when I, when I tell this story, cause she was, I mean, they're all my, I, I love them. And one of them, she's one of the hardest working athletes and she stands up and she takes it again just getting yelled at then he brings the next girl up and slaps her. And I'm in this panic mode. Like, what the hell do I do right now? Like, is this a moment where I go and say something? Like, is this where I storm out and never work with this team again? And, and upon a ton of reflection and regret and all these things, you know, do I want to work in China anymore? If this is the, you know, the industry that I'm getting into, what has occurred to me is that they just don't know any better. That, that this is not dissimilar, I think, to if I could take a time machine back to 1930s Oklahoma high school football practice. And I'm sure coaches are slapping kids in the ear hole and denying them water on the hottest day of the year as a punishment, things that would get everyone fired. Well, that's China doesn't know any better. Like I am more impacted by viewing that than the girl that got hit, most likely. That that's just the way that and that's just a sacrifice that you make as an athlete. And that's just part of their training. They, they don't do it maliciously. They do it because that's the only way they know how to train. They don't, they don't have access to, to, to YouTube videos. There's, you know, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter all are blocked. Google, you can't Google search anything in China. It's all blocked and they don't understand it anyway. All they know is in this small microcosm of their system that they grew up in. And so I take that. So there's a lot of moments in China where a coach will be incredibly pigheaded and it will be inc like, like frustratingly, um, like hair ripping that they are not taking a simple solution and running with it that you just have to remember deep breath. This is China. 
And the worst thing I could do would be to spiral out or to to get up in somebody's face because then I stop working and I stop being potentially the yin to that coach's yang. I stop being the one example of a coach that cares about them, a coach that can be funny, that makes sure that that there's fun in every workout, that listens when something hurts, that changes things to make them to make them feel more comfortable, that if they can't stand doing rear foot elevated split squats, then I'll give them a pass for a month while I do something else. I want to be that guy and I can't do it from, from America. Um, so this is kind of one of the stories I, I actually don't tell very much because it doesn't sound great about China because there is so much that's wonderful, but it's a part of it that, that your, your, you know, your stereotypes ring a little bit true. That's, that's, um, that's part. Um, but on the flip side of that, what you get is an incredible amount of compliance, like blind faith. You know, when I'm listening to your podcast while I'm over there, which is constant (laughs) because I, I I can't, as an aside, and the the strength coach podcast is so great to be able to listen, to keep up with what things that are happening back in the States and in the West, uh, while I'm over there where you feel like you're on an Island. But when I'm listening to coaches and, and I hear them having to worry about, oh, man, this kid wants to start CrossFitting. And this kid has learned that that uh, Pilates is the best thing he can possibly do. And now I got this athlete that came to me and they want to just start doing yoga. I've never once had pushback on anything I've ever said from an athlete. If I told an athlete to just go and headbutt a wall for five minutes, that athlete's going to come back to me with a bloody forehead and say, what are we doing next, coach? So – There are things like compliance that are wonderful. Um, There is an appreciation for us being over there, especially if you're over there for a long time. If you're someone that's gone to, you know, lengths to learn their language, um, they, it is incredibly rewarding because you're giving, and, and not just for me as a strength coach, but imagine the PTs, like the, the, the therapist over there, I have watched so many athletes cry in front of tears of joy in front of like David Joyce, uh, any of Greg Day, any of my great physios that I've worked with because they're in a pain for the first time that they've only had team doctors that have managed them with acupuncture and massage and cupping um, all their lives. And so when they actually get corrective strategies that work, these guys like my buddy Chris Spring has been over. He's a PT that's been over there forever. He must have 46 down jackets from all the gifts that he's given by coaches, by uh, athletes that get out of pain for the first time. So anyway, uh, that's a long winded answer, but, uh, the stereotypes uh, ring a little bit true. And that's where my passion for changing the way the sports schools are done. That's where it works. Now, the, the other side is that when you have a sports school system that only cares about long-term development and doesn't even care about like child happiness, really, you can accomplish some things that we can't get away with in the West. These guys learn incredible amounts of, they own ranges of motion and mobility that, uh, that we can't think about. And they get those when they're six because they're bent into pretzels. And then once you get it, you keep it. If you just can't keep moving through those ranges of motion, I, I, I never, I, when I'm doing, when I'm FMS testing a team, except for pain it's threes all over the place. Like they, they are incredibly flexible. They just don't own the strength usually around those range of motion or the, or the mobility. So that's where we end up focusing. That's why, you know, when I'm designing like movement prep programs, warm ups, they almost involve as, as little stretching as possible. And I, I use that time to accomplish everything else on my list of uh, needs for that team. Interesting. I mean, obviously it's uh, a little scary to hear, hear that you know the story with right the coach hitting the kids and hopefully uh hopefully that's an outlier and that doesn't happen <laughs> too much uh and i know how hard it must be for you to observe that and not be able to and maybe to feel helpless right um but um but let's talk a little bit about some of your training um you had written an article for daniel Coyle, uh who wrote the um the talent code um, and he, it was called the 10 surprising truths about the world's most successful talent hotbed. Um, I wanted to, before we get into working with some of the kids, I just wanted to talk about the regular coaching stuff. 
I love, I saw you have a video on here, and I'll have a link to that blog post, but you said we applaud spectacular failures, which I think is amazing, and it should um, really cross into not only sports, but into business, um, but applauding spectacular failures. I saw in the video the kid did some kind of backflop. It looked painful from here. Talk to us about this idea about about applauding failures. Yeah, it, it's <clears throat> one of the interesting things about the culture is that they is that the the athletes are relatively um, like don't have many inhibitions. Uh, they regularly as a punishment one of my favorite punishments that is, you see throughout teams is that they have to get up and sing in front of each other that they have to stand sing for like a minute when you're the when you're the person that finishes a sprint last um that they we dance we look like idiots in front of ourselves but also um especially with china diving they want to make a culture which there's a substantial amount of fear in diving and gymnastics of, of, of practicing something and everything going poorly and you getting really, really hurt. So they do a really good job of uh, their dry land training, which of course everyone does, but China does spectacularly well. It's in fact, if you ask the Chinese coaches what the reason is they're so dominant, they'd probably say because of our dry land stuff. Their, their dry land facilities look like Disney World, like for athletes, just like foam pits and trampolines and harnesses and just cool stuff everywhere. But they progress up to this stuff. But at some point, you got to be in a handstand on the 10 meter board attempting to do something no one's ever done before. And you know that if you don't get it, like the, the fractions of, of angle, like if you don't go in straight, you're going to feel every bit of that, every bit of going in at a bad angle. And, and he goes in at the worst angle you can possibly imagine, just straight back flop. Um, and I think I mentioned already, like he, his back was purple for weeks. He doesn't remember it. Um, you know, wow. spitting up, spitting up blood on the side of the pool. Um, but, but what you don't see and what I wish I had left the camera rolling for is that on the side of the pool, I mean, he got an ovation from all 60 people in that diving complex that everything stopped and rarely do things stop in that complex. It's usually diving going off on seven boards on both sides of the pool in a cacophony of, of activity and sound. And, uh, when he went up there, that's why I brought my camera out. Cause I didn't really was, realize what was going on, but everything stopped. Everyone watched and everyone applauded and he couldn't wait. As a result, he was, he was telling me three days later when he got, <laughs> when he finally was cleared to go to do, you know, weight training with me that, yeah, he couldn't wait to try it again, that he thought he had it cracked now. And that if we could just put another centimeter on his vertical or on his uh, on his arm stand hop, then we might be able to uh, he might be able to get those revolutions. Wow. Um, but, yeah, it was it, it, there's some been some pretty cool things. Uh, anyone that goes to China, that every new coach that, that goes over there will fill up their iPhone's memory uh, in videos of the freakish stuff that you can see in a place where no one's heard of Stu McGill and how to protect your spine, <laughs> they, yeah. they will create uh, a ton of really uh, jaw-dropping exercises and, and things. Very cool. Um, in the article, you, you had a, a bunch of more about coaching, and I want to kind of group like three of them together. You said you're obsessive about coaching every single rep. Um, there was a lot of feedback from a lot of coaches. So if anybody watches the video, you'll see a bunch of coaches hanging out on the side. And then, you know, you use a lot of video as much as humanly and technically possible. Those three things are just going to loop, loop, jump. I'm putting them all together just because the question is, is can it can it get to be over coaching? I mean, is is there an element of you know isn't it good to let them play a little bit that random play and and not over coach? Is this something that basically we would only see in a um, in a in a you know uh, not in a team sport in a single uh, person sport for the most right. part? Uh, like just touch on the over coaching aspect of that because it seems like a lot. Yeah, and I think you have hit on. Well, you said there at the very end about individual that what I've come to realize is that for a lot of these very technical sports, 
these sports like gymnastics, like diving, like shooting, like Olympic weightlifting, where getting your 10,000 hours is really important. You know, the China Chinese are going to get their 10,000 hours faster than anyone else. They're the high volumes of training that they do. Um, you know, every coach goes over there and says, all right, the first thing I do is teach you guys how to recover because there's no recovery. There's very few recovery days. There are six days a week uh, from eight hours a day. And it's very tempting to say, well, it's time for us to enlighten you on how much better you would be if you only trained hard four days a week and you gave yourself these active recovery methods and all this stuff. That I don't think is necessarily true anymore. The, the Chinese, especially in these technical sports, the, that high volume of training when it is when it is supplemented with the recovery stuff that you know our physios give them, when it's supplemented with a strength training program that just focuses on making the problem joints more robust, that they can continue to do all of that high, velo- high volume training and they're actually okay. And the benefit for that, Anthony, and by the way, I am right now – I'm trying to divorce myself from talking about like having them be happy or having them, you know, maybe uh, how they might feel as adults, you know, if their back hurts, because that's not something that anyone in China cares about. Now, I personally, of course, care about their happiness. But from a standpoint of just winning a gold medal, which is all China cares about, not silver, not bronze, that they feel that they need those that those super long hours of training. And what that gives them is that is that Wu Mingxia, Chu Bo, any of these guys that have won dozens of medals uh, for China diving, they get up on the 10 meter board with a one dive left with a gold medal on the line. And I think their heart rate sits at like 65 beats a minute, that they are robotic in their approach, that all of that high volume of training has unfortunately deadened a lot of the love of the sport. And that sucks because it doesn't feel very you know, in the Olympic spirit. It hurts to be you know, British Tom Daly who has to go up against Chubo the robot. And he calls him a robot all the time. But, but and, like, to some extent, I feel like as strength coaches, we, we throw around phrases like, like unconscious competence a lot. Well, when you're training that much, you become – unconsciously competent that there's no difference between in my brain that phrase and a robot that the mental strength of having done that so many times since you were such a little kid uh that's going to be really difficult to beat um when it comes down to huge events and and to their credit you can only do those high volumes if like daniel coy would say like these this needs to be um, deliberate practice and deliberate practice comes from getting feedback from coaches. And I give them credit for all the hours that those athletes are in the pool. Those coaches are standing at the pool deck and they don't do one dive really without a coach giving them a little something that they could do better or something that they're doing well and to keep it up. Um, that's not easy. I mean, you, we know this. You, when you have a bad day of coaching, you find yourself getting silent, giving reps and, and, you know, rep schemes and just kind of sitting there watching and not doing a lot of positive feedback or negative or making jokes or high five. And you just kind of start passively coaching like these guys don't passive coach and they are really smart about almost keeping their energy for it by sharing athletes. You know, every athlete will have their own little, you know, they're true. They're like, a, you know, there'll be one diving coach that works with five different athletes and these little pods. But they will swap athletes around in dry land training so that other coaches get to put an eye on them, give to get them more different feedback. Um, it's it's a very deliberately thought out feedback machine that includes all of the the video stuff, um, and it's all in this package that is kind of creates a perfect storm of technical greatness. And my job just becomes, and when you look at it as a strength coach. You know, you're thinking, oh, you guys probably want vertical. You want more vertical jump. You want to uh, have a lower back that doesn't hurt so much when you bend it in crazy ways. And and it's not the performance measures nearly as much as it is making their body able to withstand all those gazillions of hours of practice. And so when we came in and kind of formulated our, you know, our approach for some of those teams like that, it was much more about 
like I mentioned before, putting a suit of armor on these kids' joints to make sure they can, you know, they can they can do the stuff that that's bringing them to the podium. Interesting. I know there's going to still be some, you know, this is, I guess we could say it's controversial because there's definitely some, some thoughts in there about, you know, about children, right. And, 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 um, and how much they do eight hours for six days is a little crazy. Um, I know in the article you do say you have more fun than people would guess and watching the video, I, I could see that. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the, your, your approach here with, with the younger, the younger ones. You, you said you avoid athletes specializing in one discipline, but that's, I guess, within the sport, but you wouldn't, you know, you don't completely agree with not specializing. Um, you kind of think specializing well, in the sport is okay. Um, yeah. I mean, Anthony, look at the scoreboard. I mean, China diving wins 80% of the things they try to do, which China weightlifting is similar. The gymnastics team ain't too bad. The the shooting team, these highly technical sports, uh, it, specializing as much as it might suck and as much as it doesn't maybe create a super happy athlete if you just care about gold medals, uh, you tell me. Like It, it clearly works. Um, but I think that there's room to do it, and this is where, I, this is where I'm passionate. I think we can have both, is that – the teams are not averse to when I when I make all of my like I make almost all of my teams dance like we will throw on videos of just dance from that I rip from YouTube and I, and we're gonna make them dance and feel like kids again and the coaches always love that kind of stuff and when we play games um, you know, they're totally into it but when you think about like early specialization right, and, and sticking with this one sport that they're doing kind of year round. Well, if you contrast that with maybe a more like a more balanced model, like that, maybe more ideal American model where you got a, a a kid that plays football in one season, soccer in another season, baseball in another season, they still don't have an off season. You know, they're still training year round, and, and sure, they're they're working different muscles in different th- in different uh, in different planes, and, and they're getting um, a little bit like getting rid of maybe some asymmetries, but. To the Chinese, those asymmetries are, are kind of what they think is bringing them gold medals. If they have the asymmetries without pain, then you know, those asymmetries become kind of the gold standard for what it takes. If, if the five, all five gold medalists have an asymmetry on their shoulder mobility screen in the FMS, then we need to be getting all the girls on China diving to have that same asymmetry because clearly something about it is helping them. Yeah, and I guess um – you know, going back to what we said before, this is really, we are talking about individual sport because if we look at it, maybe uh, maybe this is evidence that um, the lack of team gold medals may, might be evidence that specializing doesn't work. Yeah, that's the other side of the coin is that when you're playing this sport, when the sport goes from being fun to being your job at 10 years old, where you stop having fun at that point, you're missing out on all of that, you know, that momentum, that camaraderie that that can sometimes be so crucial. Well, it can often be so crucial in team sports. If you look at the the women's volleyball team for Team USA is very famous for the girls on the bench. And there's not like a seat. If you guys don't know, in volleyball, there's no like seated bench. It's a little bullpen area where the, all the athletes stand. Um, most of the athletes stand. Well, after Team USA scores a point, depending on what girl scored it, they have a separate 10-second dance that they do for all the girls. And it's hysterical and it's fun and it's um, and they get a lot of press for it. In contrast to Team China, who politely clap you know, when something great happens. And they're kind of just stand there. Well, to some extent, and, and um, this my team is much more spirited than a lot, but a lot of these sports stop being that fun for them. And so as a result... You know, it can feel like a job and you you miss out on the Disney moment um, when when it's kind of when it's just work. And, yeah, that that one child system and uh, the one child policy and the sports school system and maybe their educational educational system that doesn't allow for a lot of free thinking. All that can contribute um, and to why Team America kicks China's ass in almost everything sport, anything team sport related. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Um, let's go over. You had said uh, we mix ages like crazy. Um, talk to me about that because that would be another thing that I think some people might say is okay. Like Greg Rose and, and the long term athletic development model will, uh, you know, for golf anyway, will say um, put the kids with who they're uh, more, um, not so much the uh, biological age, but more of uh, maybe, maybe you know, because sometimes a, an 11 year old who hasn't had a growth spurt might be the same size as a nine-year-old. So talk to us about how you guys mix ages. Yeah, and, and Greg Greg has come over to China a bunch of times and we'll go out for hamburgers and we've talked about this because his hat system, it's almost like you know the belt system in, in, uh, in karate is really important and is part of the model that I would love to put into a Chinese school where, yeah, two 11-year-olds don't look alike. But from a from a mirroring standpoint, um, from being able to, it's almost like, like Anthony, if I asked you, like, what do you think? If, if, if the choice between going to film school, um, you know, at NYU film school for five years or getting to sit beside and, and mirror and, and shadow Steven Spielberg for his next three films over the next five years. Like, I, I think you might learn more from the Spielberg time mm -hmm. than you would in film school. It's not dissimilar to the Chinese, the Chinese approach for allowing a 12 year old junior diver to room with a four time gold medalist and to see what she's eating every day and see when she wakes up and see what it's like to have to handle the media and see how hard she trains and watch her. I mean, there's one thing to read about it, but when you are, I mean, that's, that's trauma. And like, there's so many articles and so much good research about, to some extent, trauma breeds talent. You know, there, it's the stories of, um, you know, of the hundred meter runner. So many of the guys that have gone under 10 seconds were, were the youngest kid in their family, like continually beaten up that, you know, great achievers come from broken homes really often. There's studies about, you know, the guys with the longest entries in the Encyclopedia Britannica an incredible amount of them had a parent that was killed when they were like in an early age or died in an early age that, that trauma to some extent will create either John Hinckley Jr. or, you know, John Lennon. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, and so there's a science I think behind manufacturing low levels of trauma. If, if it's, Dirty, you know, kind of non-sparkly weight rooms, you know, to a grittier gym. If it's, um, if if it's dedicated time, making people uncomfortable, grit, ESC, that kind of stuff. But having to get, having to go from being in your sports school at 12 years old and you have dominated everyone in your province at diving for, the, for every year of your life since you started diving, and then you room with Wu Ming Xia, who kicks your ass every single day and. Well, now you just got a big brother that is beating you up. And that's the that's the trauma and that's the mixing ages. That's the part of that that uh, I think well, what China dive – well, not just diving, which most of the Chinese sports do that pretty early with their athletes uh, to achieve that exact benefit. Very cool. Yeah, agreed. It's uh, having, having those mentors certainly uh, can be uh, super important. Uh, right. I want to finish up. With one more question that I kind of probably a little more of a stereotypical question too, um, you know, meditation, it's, you know, obviously it's an important part of Eastern philosophy and religion. Um, and I would think it's part of the culture there as well. Is there, did you, do you guys use that? Is it, is it, is it a part of maybe recovery strategies or, or even for visualization, especially in the individual sports, um, was uh, was that uh, at least a piece of it? You know, meditation is – it's a little more Indian than Chinese. And to answer your question quickly, I do more meditating than my girls do. I I had a girl on my – and the women's volleyball – the captain of the women's volleyball team actually had open heart surgery in the offseason. She had a, a freak heart problem. And as a result, keeping control of her heart rate – became a really big priority, giving her strategies for calming her heart rate down. And so for that reason, like, unfortunately, she speaks enough English and I could take her through enough of it that I could download 
the Calm app on her phone and put her in, and we would start doing meditation with her um, just as an aside. But I, um, I have employed it a little bit with the, with the teams that I've worked with, especially with the women's volleyball team, as I've personally gotten into meditating more. Um, <laughs> the first time I ever did it, and this was before London, uh, this was visualization actually, um, we're doing a cool down strategy and at a cool down and we we're doing visualization had all the girls laying in a, you know, a uh, supine position eyes closed i'd gotten them to dim the lights and i bring a translator over and i was like okay i'm gonna take them through just a couple of simple things to put in their head okay tell them to start taking deeper breaths and i'm like whispering trying to create this mood my translator was like like just screaming at the girls in this horrible coaching voice that just like I, every girl jumping through the roof while I had to explain that this meditation thing is not going to work out so well. This visualization process is not going to work out so well if you are uh, cheerleading in their ears at the, your maximum <laughs> decibels. Um, we have the <laughs> – meditation for them is it would be it would be really tough for me because i think it's most valuable if it's guided and i can and i just think that it would be you know i speak a lot of mandarin but i don't know if i speak enough mandarin to keep enough variety in that to keep them engaged what we do though is we do i think it's really important that we calm down the central nervous system uh, these girls, one of the benefits or one of the things that China has mastered is napping. Like these girls, you know, they train eight hours a day, but that's because we go from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., but we give ourselves a three-hour nap window at lunch. Um, so these girls do a pretty good job of like mentally calming down. All of them can fall asleep within 30 seconds being on a bus. Like They are pretty good at calming their minds. Um, it's another thing that China just doesn't have many distractions. I feel like the, the wave of popularity of of, of meditation right now is because we're trying to quiet the noise that we get from so many of the distractions in our world. I already mentioned that all the fun apps on your phone are blocked in China. So that calms a lot of the noise. But the girls, uh, when you work in communist China, when you're an athlete in communist China, you don't get to see your cell phone all day. And that's just the way of life. And no one pushes back on it, that all that gets monitored. So they actually don't need the need meditation in the way that we do. Um, so for that reason, I haven't worried about that kind of meditation very much. We do a ton of breathing. We'll do a lot of the, of like Anna Hartman's like sitting and, and Phil Resting Beach's sitting posture. postures. Yeah. We do a lot of that. Um, which I learned about on your show and look, took a deep dive as deep as I could. And uh, so I have you to thank for that. Um, but we will mix in, um, all kinds of, of things that are, that are similar to that, to that, that calm our CNS down, um, that are short of meditation. Uh, and, and I think we achieve the desired result. Very cool. Oh man. Very cool. This is, uh, it's such an interesting, uh, journey, uh, that you've had so far. Um, and, uh, we really appreciate you coming on and, uh, and, and talking, to us, talking to us about it and uh, giving us an idea about, you know, what, what's happening over there, what's going on. So, uh, Rhett, thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, and it, I, I can't tell you, as I mentioned before, your voice and the voice of all the guests that you have in my ear every couple of weeks as I am jamming myself into a Beijing subway or trying to block out the, <laughs> the noise of a, a crowded market is, has been is a respite that I could never live without. It would be a deal breaker if I couldn't uh, have access to the podcast, yours and so many and so many others. But, but uh, yeah, it's I give you a big thanks, and this has been a real treat for me as a fan of yours. Very cool. Thanks again. All right, that's going to do it for episode 195 of the Shrink Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Poyer, Rob Milani, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for their products and info on their educational seminars. Don't forget, the one days start in New Jersey in December. Thanks to Coach Poyle and Coach Rhett Larson for sharing their insights 
and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning, nutrition and performance enhancement. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at ResultsFitnessUniversity.com. Alistair McCall from the McCallMethod.com. Eric Degatti and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at FunctionalMovement.com. And of course, remember, you can join TrainCoach.com and have access to the site for just one dollar three days just a buck to access that offer go to strengthcoach.com click the join now button to get started on your three-day trial my name is anthony renner you can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com thanks again and i'll speak to you next time